everyone. Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And on today's uh, episode of Wandering DMs, we are really thrilled to have special guest Ernie Gygax with us. Uh, welcome to the show, Ernie. Welcome, Dan. Welcome, Paul. It's good to see you. <laughs> Great Thank you for having show. us in your house today. <laughs> yeah. So obviously wish, Ernie has been... So obviously everybody knows who, who you are, but I'll just say, so Ernie's been really fundamental to the growth and evolution of D&D. And uh, so Ernie, you and I are around the same age. And, you know, you, you and D&D grew up together, I think. And I was, seeing, I was seeing online here the line that I really love that you literally cut your first tooth on an Avalon Hill Panzer division. I love that. <laughs> so, um, you know, so you and I uh, first communicated because we were co-judges of the one-page dungeon contest back, I think, about six years ago, which was, I think you and I agree, a whole heck of a lot of reading. <laughs> yeah, a lot of reading, but there were, there were about, say, 20 great um, dungeons or, not, or layouts, one-page dungeons. Yeah, there were. Like, I think we got, what were we going, like, through 60 or something like that? And that's exactly what I did, is I came up with, like, a top 20 myself. So that did, that was about the, the, the high quality count. You're right. You're right. I think it was 100, but it was, it was yeah. too many. Okay. It, was too, it was too many. I feel like I got a PhD in, in, in dungeon analysis from that. <laughs> it's a great resource, honestly. I still recommend that to folks when they're like, oh, I need a quick dungeon. I say, go look up the annals of, because uh, it was, ran for many years. Maybe it's still going on. I don't know. But uh, I'm a lot of great, sure. great material. Yeah, I got to admit, I think they burn through judges every year because <laughs> once, you, so much once you do it once, I don't think anybody's done it twice. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, you blind. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Like I love D and D, and I love all things D and D. It was like that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So, um, so, so, Ernie, there's a couple of things in um, in classic D and D that Paul and I still like to run that that apparently you specifically came up with, um, like uh, I guess I guess the cone of cold spell and the fact that haste ages people. And, you know, something really fundamental is the fact that um, different classes have different hit dice. So you were, you were fundamental to that switch? I'm afraid in all those cases, just because my father was always trying to even out the game so that there wouldn't be a distinct advantage for being a, a magic user or an elf or whatever these mid-maxes that everybody does, because as a young man... I was always looking to get the edge and to get the most items, to get the, the highest level of everybody else, and it was highly competitive as well as fun. We, we fought and protected each other, but we all were looking out for number one. That's, that's so interesting. With, yeah. in mind, with, with that in mind, Dad had to try to not allow one of us to get up too far out of balance and disturb the game. And I... I did, I, I first character to get um, other characters. I um, I hired an elf and a dwarf, and then I picked up a couple of sidekick magic users as apprentices, and I was probably the fifth level or sixth level when I started hiring people and adding on. I mean, regularly. With, and... I, so my guy started getting up in levels. And crew that NPCs only get half experience when they're adventuring with you, unless you're doing an adventure with, with them as the primary character and you're not involved. Um, it's really interesting because I think that's, that's one of the things that, like, like new, like you know, people learning the game in their twenties, like, find that really surprising that they want it. Like, they kind of want this one spotlight just on the one character. And, you know, when I run the classic game for, for new players, they kind of have this transition period where they real and it's right around fifth or sixth level, like you're saying, where they realize how useful that is to have, you know, other characters that they can rely on. And then they really get into it, I think. So I, I, I do think it's a really nice aspect of the old school game to make that possible. And it's, it's also a good way to uh, pass on what were once used items but aren't quite good enough anymore. So you, you right. stick them down to the lactans. <laughs> you know, right. Here's a plus one card. Here's a plus one shield. Right, you're, right. You're doing pretty cool. Right, you know, right. You're only second level. Right. <laughs> right, and plus in a game, you know, plus in a game where it's actually really easy to die, it's good to have this bench of characters that can step up if you do lose one of your characters. You've already got them half developed, which is really smart too. 
But, um, uh, but that's the way we would involved, play. They could be involved in a rescue mission because we did rescue missions for people. If somebody was turned down and, and then the other players gang up and everybody tries to come. And he, Dad, of course, I was a mapper. So the maps I've made on an mission that something bad happened to me or somebody else, those maps weren't, weren't allowed. Okay. So you yep. had to do it all from memory. Great. <laughs> great. That's that's great. How many how many mazes, like how many mazy type things did your dad run? Because sometimes we struggle with that, but like me and Paul and our friends, like how many like like weirdo entangled mazy stuff did he run? Was that a common element? Yes, it was a common element. And it got more and more difficult as you went down lower. As 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 did the traps. So that's why slanting <laughs> passages came into it account and why they're generally really long instead of just a, just like going to a baseball park where it's real steep. Instead, it's a, it's a slow slant to try to fool you uh, right. so that you don't know that you're another level right. and your maps get more screwed up that way. Uh, right. So mapping was very important. Rob Kuntz wasn't a big mapper, but he was uh, but he had a great recall. And he'd also try to stay in one direction. like he'd always be, And then north, west, north, but all possible. And he do something like that on an individual adventure, so he could always then go east and then south to try to work his way back. Clever, um, clever. Well, there was I all mean, sorts I... of things. And like I said, the Kona Cold was the third level spell when I yep. first created it. Yeah. And yep. Dad made it uh, a D four plus one, to make it slightly different than a D six per per level. And it didn't destroy magic items. I, I figured out that uh, it, it, as, long as, as long as you allowed the characters to thaw slowly or the foes <laughs> before you start trying to rip stuff off. So it was real handy because I had a portable hole. So I would kill something, and if, if it seemed to have something and it was too large, I could always even just slash up, try to break some part of the body far enough away. Hopefully it doesn't shatter the whole thing and <laughs> throw, you know, and. So he had assorted things. I get that. That's really clever because obviously in the original game, it specifically says if you hit magic or coins or gems with a with a fireball or a lightning bolt, they're going to break. So that's a really clever shortcut around that. That's smart. Got it. Well, Got it. Yeah. And, it was, and that's it, why it became fifth? Yes. And it was fourth for a long, long time. Okay. And then Dad said, heck with it. This is, you know, we're making this fifth level. So that that made it. I still love it, but it's not as special as it was. So of course, it's third or fourth level. Great, great, great. Um, so our uh, our viewer Daniel Boggs is wondering if you held on to any of those maps, Ernie. Is he, do you still have any of them kicking around, or are they lost into the ages? No, oh, they're they're lost to the ages, sadly. Yeah. Ages. Yeah, mostly I know. I, I personally, as a kid, was terrible. At... No, Sorry, go on, Ernie. mostly just uh, moving and having different relationships that have allowed things, you know, mm. what do you got that stupid stuff for, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I, I yeah. stepped away like most people do at a certain period and got involved in other things and then came back to gaming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, 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 for many personally, as an adult, I've had to repurchase a lot of the books I had as a kid because <laughs> I was just not a responsible child with my things. <laughs> <laughs> well, besides that, I had a fire also, so back in 2013. Oh, oh that's, and that's heartbreaking. I, right. Yeah. You know, I got some things. I had a, a few items I was able to get back, and even then, it was, I let them sit in a, in a, in a barn for a couple of years to let the smoke, it was almost all the smoke damage, and then was mm -hmm. with Simply Green. And, and my, my Gary Khan poster, Welcome to Gary Khan 4, that's my dad, the the side plastic frame had melted on it, so I had to oh. take it to a printer and have them cut all that away and put another silly plastic frame around it. So it lost about two inches on the whole edge. Wow. Um, oh, wow. But but the picture survives, huh? And you still have the... Yeah, the picture survives. And, That's great. And a few other things. But yeah, and I could have probably gotten more things, but you really, you take a, a horrible morale uh, throw. Yeah. When when you see your world up in flames, I walked out of there with a, a pair of night shorts, a t-shirt, and my car keys and wallet. 
that's a real gut check. Wow. That's that's real. That's a real scary story. Yeah, that's a real gut check. Wow. A dog. Good, good for you for bouncing back. Dog and a roommate too. But... Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's if you've been hit by an things. ice storm, it would have been a lot better. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it would have. Yes, it would have. No, ice storm does. If you do it in the cubes, it does physical damage. But Dad would still have things have to do crashing blows. True. So <laughs> that's why the code of doesn't do that that harsh sure. weight damage. Okay, you're right. You're right. I um. So the so obviously so so you were tensor, right? So so um yeah. so among the other the other firsts, I guess you were the official Gygaxian first magic user as tensor, and uh, so I guess that kind of has a has a funny history is that you were uh, finding ways to make tensor actually work like a fighter. And I guess that's part of it. So Paul and I were just talking last week a whole bunch about why fighters have multiple attacks in classic D&D. And I said, so I guess you were partly responsible for fighters getting multiple attacks? Well, we all were getting multiple attacks against uh, one-hit die critters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, with hmm. their level yeah. of attacks, which is a carryover from Chainmail. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then he, then he started doing the three for two for fighters at the seventh level and the two for one at 13. And he was just really frightened that as I was, as, as Tensor, I was creating more and more power that was just. He, he's, he's still, to his dying day, my dad thought that the Mage user was the most powerful class. And the experience points were that much more for, for levels. I went to the D4. Because, yeah, I would just fight. I just didn't have armor. That was the only thing. But as soon as I'd done whatever spells I had, I'd be in there with the staffs fighting it next to my elf and my dwarf. And <laughs> well, that was for the solo adventures. And other adventures, it would be like Rob Koontz and Terry Koontz a lot. Or right. a lot of other people. But those were the original gamers. Terry was probably in about 30% of the games, and Rob was at 80%. Cool. Cool. So we, yeah. we've seen. Um, uh, sorry, Paul. Who's the other guy you gave the book to? All of a sudden, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, oh, uh, Tim Kask and Frank Menser. Right. So we've seen Tim Kask say, uh, like you just said, that your father really didn't like magic users. But on the other hand, he himself ran Morden Canaan, right? Was that like well, him breaking his, his own game? No. Okay. Urag oh. was his primary character, the fighter. Oh, okay. Morden Canaan was his, was his lackey. And so was Big B. Really? So Morton wasn't, wasn't his primary character. You ragged the fighter hmm. and then when things would get tough. So, but as a slow adventurer, he ended up being a core of like four guys always going on adventures. So oh, really? which one was his main? You ragged was the first one. You know, it's and interesting Felner, because... Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I just said you ragged and Felnerith were his two fighters... And Morton Kynan and Big B, whereas there's, and I think he had a Sigby Gibson, who was a cleric. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he was always having fun with names. Interesting. You know, the, so obviously we understand that, um, you know, it, it's a business and, you know, Wizards of the Coast, uh, you know, makes productions with all those characters that you guys came up with. And I guess yeah. I was talking to some guys that still run Greyhawk games and, you know, they're understandably a little bit irritated that those things are now available on the on the DMs Guild site for anybody to use, except that you're you're not. And yet at the same time, you're not allowed to place them in Greyhawk anymore. And so obviously the funny thing is they have all kinds of products they've developed with with Mordenkainen on it. And very few people know about a rag anymore. So that's I, I myself was confused about that. That's fascinating that it was, the, the relationship was the other way around. And and uh, tensor, uh, I, I never went on higher than fourteenth level. You know, yep. all this that was when I retired. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I had the magic user's crown. I was really thirteenth level. But the crown gave another level, but the damn crown made me have to get off the neutral fence and either go good or evil. Okay. So this crown gave all kinds of powers, like a fifteen percent magic resistance, uh, automatic. Level gain, unlimited self teleportation, uh, uh, safely, uh, probably something else. But anyway, this was this really cool thing that I fought really hard and competed against Rob Coots. Rob was trying to find this, 
to give it to an evil wizard who is going to give him a bunch of other cool things that he could use. And Rob started. <laughs> Rob was the first hunter, and then I suddenly found out, well, what's happening? Why is all this money going on and all this? So I put out my own scouts, and and then it became a contest between us to try to find this art. Let me ask this. The um, So in, in the published version of uh, The Isle of the Ape, right, adventure, yeah. it starts off with like a fully, I think, page and a half monologue from Tensor, right? So I, so when I've delivered that, like I have to spend about 20 minutes giving these these uh, this monologue trying to find the voice of Tensor. <laughs> did you actually play through The Isle of Ape yourself? Why is, is that, was that, did you actually get I was involved there. with that? Yes, I was there and so was Jim Ward. He was with me, and he was <laughs> he was lower level. His character was Bombadil. Um, but I, you know, I I don't remember the Isle of the Eight fondly because I think I was I found the treasure. I I had an Earth Elemental tearing up underneath the ground where the girl would be strapped as the sacrifice. Okay. And it's like didn't or couldn't get in there, and all this I. Used my only wish to get us all out of. Oh, okay. It's a punishing <laughs> adventure. It's a totally punishing adventure. And like the very first thing that happens is you get jumped like by two hundred natives with giant gorillas, right? Is that like when I, I ran it? I was like, I don't even know how to run this. I don't remember any giant gorillas. Okay. Uh, there are giant gorillas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew there was one. Right. There was one in Kong, of course. Uh, and ter Tyrannosaurus Rexes and other nasty things. Right. It's a great adventure, but punishing. My my, the party that I ran through it was, uh, they were wiped out. <laughs> I, I think we did. Um, so there might have even been another guy there. I don't know if it was Don K or what, but somebody I think got up and levitated. So there was arrows and spears coming at him, and there was. Yeah lightning bolts coming down at people and dad had of course lightning bolts and things drawing in other large critters great great, great. so, so the more, you, the more you, you describe some of these games where it's more, where it's just you um where, where you kind of playing solo right and then and then some other games with other folks and i'm kind of curious and one of our one of our viewers is asking the same question of like how um you know, how many people did you typically have around the table? How often was it just you and Dad versus like a big group? And and how big did that group get uh, when it was a when it was a big group? Well, now playing with Dad, the groups didn't get as large. I don't think they ever got more mm -hmm. than say like eight, eight ten people. Um, where I've run games on all the time with thirteen to twenty two people. But I've been running games generally as part of a hobby shop or a convention rather than my yeah. per I even in personal games now. It's hard to turn away anybody that wants to play. So I have to just pick and choose. Yeah. Then we generally get a guest yeah. coming in. I totally wanted to ask about that because so, you know, we've seen, um, you know, the number of players thing as we've seen, uh, you know, in the books and your dad writing about having as many as up into the 20s. Uh, Paul and I have uh, played in a game with Bill Webb where we had 23 people one night, 27. I've gotten up as much as 14 myself. And there's a lot of younger people that just don't believe that's even possible. They just can't imagine that that's even possible. Do you do anything well, different when you're running a big group with like 22 people? Well, generally you need somebody to be the general caller. He can get the party mm -hmm. call. We can put from everybody else. And then when it's actual combat, I do an initiative system where I have everybody roll a six-sided die, and then they add any of their dexterity benefits. So if you've got an 18 dexterity, you've got a, a plus three, I think. It could be yeah. two. Uh, your, yeah. your initiative. So then I'm going, it's, it's just plus three. I go, okay, now everybody. And I say, if... If you have the same number as somebody else, have it in your head what you're going to do, and then say it because you can't react to, to George's efforts if you're Paul. And you're it's okay. So then, and then we just go right on the thing. So it becomes kind of uh, like a metronome. Okay, eight, seven, six. Okay, start doing the sixes. 
Okay. And then, okay, the monsters have a five. <laughs> but I, for the monsters, I generally do it all as a group. So if there's a particularly special uh, boss fiend, bad guy, whatever, he might get something in his lackeys will get a different initiative. Uh, so that that's how you just try to do that. Uh, split parties are very hard to do. I've done it in large yeah. groups. So boy, is that painful. But, yeah. but if somebody's sweeping around to do a motion or something like that, well, that's okay. Yeah. Or And it's always fun to take somebody off to the side if they grab something, even if it's doing nothing. But you take a little bit of time and talk to them. So when they come back, the other people think maybe they're taking over or they're trying to steal something. It's so discord at the same time. Because your job is to make it fun. You're not trying to party kill stuff is garbage. That's um, well, that's on the shirt there. <laughs> okay. okay. I, yeah. I've failed as well as, as they. You know, if, if I haven't somehow shared the game well enough where they're learning something and they have a chance. There has to be an element of danger. And, you know, level losses. Oh, my God. I do steal levels, of course. That's something that a lot of people don't understand anymore. You know, they're highly feared. That's why fireballs just almost always go off when you see a bunch of undead. Doesn't matter if I'm going to write, you know, material stuff. Get rid of these guys <laughs> before they kill me. <laughs> I get that. I still use that, and I feel like I, I agree with you. It's important to have like a real element of of risk, and you know, my games tend to wind up being horror games, even if I don't want them to. Particularly when the when the level draining undead come out, so I I, I like having them part of the the game. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. I mean, I, I feel like um, that that. It, Eight to ten players is um, even like most uh, you know younger players these days are are saying that that's really big, right? Like I I feel like yeah. more often I'm seeing four or six players at the table. Um, yeah. Eight to ten is is a lot of people to juggle. Um, sure. Well, what, I wait. What what point do you feel like you need the caller to come in? Like, cause I cause it's funny because I mean I've been playing for a whole bunch of years and then. I just came to this same realization that there's a particular switchover point where you need the collar. Like, at what point do you really feel like you need the collar? Uh, what when you start stop having fun and everybody's talking at the same time. <laughs> at you. So there is no magic number. It's when the people themselves are starting to make this a chore rather than a fun activity. I should yep. okay. So my my yep, personality sounds... tends to be I want a number, but that's probably better advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! What rule? What? So, what rule set do you play with? Do you play with like advanced rules, or do you play with yeah. like the original advanced, rule book? Advanced first edition. Um, a few things. I, I still have gems in the old-fashioned method, where um, they go up on a one and they go down on a six. When you when, so you get a, a pool of say twenty gems. That are based uh, 50 gold pieces. And it's possible yep. that one of them could be 100,000 or more. Very unlikely. But yep. you just keep on re rolling. On yep. a one, it goes up, and you roll again. Oh, but there's a flaw here on a six. So then, as soon as, soon as you roll something that is two through five, that gem is set aside, it it's now has its value established. And that makes it a lot of fun for the players that say, okay, you get four gems, you get five, and then. Start getting polished up and, and looking to see if you somehow struck it rich and got the big experience point payoff. Because the first edition, it's money is the primary, it's you know experience point reward. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. And it's an interesting point about you know the fact that you're that you're you're mixing and matching at least a couple things from what some people would consider to be different editions. And certainly, you know, most of us growing up, me and Paul kind of used a little bit of a mishmash of different editions. And I think I saw a little while ago Frank Metzer saying they're totally one continuous game. Like in your in your opinion, is is the the first advanced game just basically a continuation of what came before it, or do you think it's like a really radical break? It was it was a continuation of the, the original D and D. Gotcha. Uh, so you feel like you could take earlier stuff and just be using it all the same the same game. Oh sure, the same dungeon. Uh, my dungeons from nineteen seventy eight. Okay, right. it's called the Hobbit right. Dungeon, 
And this is a um, replication of the of the Happy Shot Dungeon. I'll just try to. I totally wanted to see this. <laughs> like the second level. Great. Third level. Great. All these have been have been increased by six times. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here. Third level. So you see, there's you get more stone as you're down deeper. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, the levels are with thin walls. Yep. Yep. You start. Okay. Great. And then for the fifth level, uh, we use the geomorphs that I used to work on, the dungeon geomorphs. Great. Great. All right. Oh, that's awesome. And then for the sixth level, I took a Luzaki piece of graph paper that was 10 squares to the inch that was about 4 feet by 3 feet, and that was my whole 6th level. Great. And that the 6th level was basically a, a 6 through 12 for difficulty. Okay. Okay. Uh, now you realize there's going to be some of our viewers that are going to take screenshots of what you just put up and then take Photoshop <laughs> and be spending like about a thousand man hours trying to, trying to perfectly recreate what you just showed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what else will happen though is that, like I said, we've got each one of these levels. Benoit Poir, who is a partner of mine with with GP Adventures, has uh, taken these and taken the the core of them and made it like six times larger. And he is an incredible, awesome. incredible map maker. He is the best freehand map maker I know, cartographer. Um. This is what he did for Gygax number three. Wow. Wow. That's lovely. And, that's um, really lovely, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's the top level of the Memorial Tomb. It's had some minor modifications, and then there's a second level, and a third, the fourth, the chaos, and that's all part of the Kickstarter that's finally, very late, getting out. And a lot of that is due to a good friend of mine and a good friend of my father's, uh, Stephen Schnaltz, with Troll Lord Games. So once this Kickstarter is officially filled, there's going to be all kinds of people getting in and buying as a back, backer, uh, Phil. And if we've got a kind of a equivalent to World of Greyhawk, our world setting, and then Ben does work with individual hexes trying to show how you can go as detailed as you want to. As my dad, a lot of the, the Greyhawk things, if you would pick it up now, it would it would be mostly uh, four ogres, hidden treasure here in club, that kind of thing. And then he makes them come alive and fills them. Um, and he would say fireball wand, say inside of the club or, or something like that, you know, so if you'd have to <laughs> somehow find... Not only did you have to vanquish the foe, but you had to find the hidden treasure. Uh, right. um, but on, a, on any sort of module you'd buy, of course, you need a lot more detail than that. <laughs> like yeah. a page instead of a, a paragraph. And yeah, I think we, we can see the, the evolution of like some really, really early documents and having to get you know built up for, for people that aren't as savant at dming as as your as you and your father uh, were um uh and sometimes that, sometimes that can be a bit of a struggle so so what so do you, do you think that like most of what your father was doing was like improvised on the fly and do you do it the same way i do a great deal of improvisation um involving i'm trying to keep it fun challenging especially if they're getting something too easy or if something's too hard then you try to leave some sort of other thing, or you start rolling for a an, a wandering monster to come in, and even though it's not necessarily a re rescue, it's it's something to throw something in the work to change things, so that potentially they could pull out and escape, even though they've wasted resources and possibly taken a bunch of damage, but there Great. there'd be hope, Great. Great. you know. Um, so yes, I. Uh, it's I definitely don't just read off a book when I'm dungeon mastering by any means, and I don't expect anybody else to. The rules 
are just guidelines. They're intelligent guidelines that have been play tested a lot. But if it doesn't work for you and your people, then change it to something that does. But allow new people to come in or whatever else to do understand that you have these deviations from the norm. And uh, the best test of that will be if people still want to come and play. Once you start losing players, then you, you're, you're, you're too long in your own world instead of sharing an experience with them. I like that as a kind of market research perspective towards your game. <laughs> I, I think I think that's really great advice, honestly, and that's, that's stuff that really resonates, I think, with both Dan and I. That's certainly how we run our games. Um, before we gloss over it, though, I really want to quickly touch again. Uh, you were mentioning your Kickstarter, which I believe is the Marmorial Tome Kickstarter. Yeah. And just for the sake of our viewers, could you tell us, like, what's, what's the status of that? If somebody had never heard of it, is it something that they can still find somewhere? Um, uh, well... You can yeah. you can find anything you need with the Troll Lord uh, games people, and great at this status, all everybody's got is a um, PDF of the beta version, meaning that um, well right now all the, the the Kickstart people are getting a chance to give some instant returns, saying you've got a typo on page four, paragraph three, and this and that. All right. That this chart doesn't make sense somehow or whatever. So they're getting before this all gets polished up and printed. But uh, like I said, I can't I can't say highly enough. Well, Stephen Chanel and Troll Lords used to used to deal with my dad's old materials once um, once TSR was stolen from him, and after TSR then went on to kill Game Designers Workshop that dad was working with. It was just yeah, <laughs> there was a there was a definite hate. Lorraine Williams probably has a special level of hell for her. <laughs> that was that was a that was a tense that was a tense time for all of us, I think. And so your your Kickstarter for Memorial Tomb, I guess that's based on the first level. It's an expansion of the first level of the Dungeon Hobby Shop, yeah. right? So we have more to well, come. Well, so well, after it, this, there's more to go. It's in the Dungeon Hobby Shop. No, it was only made for Gygax Magazine. Because uh, Jason Elliott said, could you do something, you know, really special? Because there was, there was games inside a Dragon magazine, and this is the new Dragon in all respects. So can we somehow, and I said, of course. So I got Ben and I together. I said, let's stop working on this thing that we've been working on for three or four, four years. The, the Dungeon Hobby Shop, the same world. Let's make a individual scenario so that it can be the centerfold. So instead of instead of pretty girls, if you're a good gamer geek, you have. <laughs> <laughs> and your Kickstarter has been your Kickstarter has been <laughs> super course. successful too, right? Your original goal was like 20k, and it's up over 120k contributions now, right? Well, yes, it was, and most of that, almost half of that money's been spent on art and other things, but I'm. Still holding on to about seventy-eight thousand or whatever else for printing, maybe yeah. about seventy-six now. I for a, another editor with Stephen, I, I threw them some chump change just for okay. spending all this time and resting. With us. <laughs> that's that seems wise. That's it. That seems yeah. wise to treat your henchman well. I think. Yeah, <laughs> well, he, he, he's more than a henchman. He's a lifetime friend. I was that's... I was at his very first convention. Uh, Trollcon one down in Little Rock, Arkansas, as a guest of honor, back in uh, two thousand one. That was that was just that's when um that's when we originally did the Lost City of Gaxmore. That's another project that's open, that's been done through um, Troll Arts, and it was that was something that I did with a prisoner uh, in the Florida state prison system. He'd been a car thief that somehow did an escape attempt, and he did another escape attempt and injured a guard, so he was stuck in solitary 23 hours in, one hour out in a cage. Wow. Oh, <laughs> holy moly. He had a lot of time. Yeah, so we worked a little bit on that, then I got my brother involved in it, and my dad read through it because he was still alive, and so it was it was obviously started around 2007 or so, but I was I was I, I took this and said, okay, instead of doing these solo uh, snail mail adventures with this one guy, 
I said, why don't we start sharing gaming ideas that I can then use with the kids at the game guilds? The kids. These kids are now 40 something. But I mean, then they were teenage boys <laughs> play in my game. <laughs> and they're good kids too. And I still love to play games with them. And, and lots of them now are running games with their children. That's what's fantastic is to see it be past generation to generation. And the love. Totally There's two, agree. Well, it's not only sons. Yeah. yeah, that's the only good. That's a really good thing about modern D and I don't like it as much in many ways, but somehow it seems to have appealed to the feminine psyche. And God bless. Let everybody play. <laughs> well put. So I'm well losing put. my tangent. What would you like me to talk about? But the Guy Gax mm. Magazine Memorial Tomb. Uh, lot the Gaxmore stuff. Actually, they, we just did a edition of Lost City of Gaxmore. Which also did over a hundred thousand dollars, and wow. it's it's looking beautiful. And I've got a giant map, like five feet long, canvas map done by uh, uh, Alyssa Farnden. and my brother is showing it. I haven't pulled it out of the tube yet because I'm going to set it up at my uh, fiance's house. It looks like we're going to be moving to her big house, and this will be a rental or something for somebody. Maybe it'll be a a, a, a one day at a time thing for people to be able to rent and then come over and play. That's <laughs> so awesome. We it in that way. That's <laughs> awesome. Geneva and stay in <laughs> now, one thing you did, now, one thing you just mentioned about, like, yeah, actually, that, that I know Paul totally was, was really eager to hear about was, you know, you have friends and they've moved away. And for some of us, we used to have to play by mail, right? Nowadays, yeah. we do have some extra tools and like a bunch of us have just jumped into you know playing online just in the last couple of months. Now, of course, GaryCon this year had to go virtual. Um, how much how much virtual stuff did you do for GaryCon this year? Zero. Okay. I uh, okay. I was involved in the setup with the concept. Said go great. I'm inviting people over to my house, and we're going to do a mini GaryCon. Okay. So it didn't it, it, it shrank it shrank and shrank down to just being four guests. Okay. Tom Wong and three others, and and I was able to give him the, the trophy for the E. Gary Gygax Award for this year for outstanding you know game creation, and that's on a video as well. That's on the Gary Con site as well as I think on my on my site. Cool. Um, that's, that's great. I mean, I'm, I'm glad, really glad you guys were able to do something online there. I know the, the timing of GaryCon was just like right in the crosshairs of the of the current situation. So, uh, really, kudos to you for 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 shifting and and doing something with with folks. Um, do you yeah, have any plans for doing other further virtual stuff, or is your eyes now on uh, on on uh, a live GaryCon next next March? Oh, it, it's going to be definitely a live GaryCon next March, and right. Um, also, we've really topped out on size. So, okay. the people that have mm -hmm. that are willing, uh, those people that bought tickets last year, aren't getting their full refund unless they really, really insist. Otherwise, they're getting like half credit towards this next year, and they're also getting guaranteed positioning in. Um, so, mm -hmm. so it'll be almost like buying stadium tickets to an event, where you'll you'll be grandfathered <laughs> in. For getting all the, the premier stuff, and then if you, you still want to come in with day passes or whatever you can, but we've the the reason for this is that we've come to a decision that I, Luke could change. He's he's like the guy in charge, um, but I we all have input. The children, um, and he has to do all the work too. Let's put that where it's important. Um, <laughs> Always good to have someone to do all the work. Lake Geneva is Gary Khan. It's it's TSR. It's yeah. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And there'll be a slight pull, of course, that there's that somewhere in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, you know, St. Paul. But otherwise, this and we and finally our, our town is coming together. Our the local Geneva Lakes Museum now has a TSR Gary Gygax room that they're getting ready to open. With a, with a big gaming table and everything, you actually be able to play. 723 Ooh. William Street, the very first building that we bought 
as a company, Gary and and, and Brian Bloom, and had it as the dungeon hobby shop in the bottom area, the shipping department in the kitchen, the basement was a storage for all the TSR product, except for a warehouse or two. Um, upstairs was the art department. Gary, uh, early on, Tim Cask came in with a Dragon Magazine, which had first been Strategic Review. Uh, Brian had an office. Kevin, we had the accountants down there. My mom had the uh, the uh, advertising agency, Powell Associates. Uh, all, all that worked out of that one house. So that's going to be a gaming museum <laughs> mecca place to come to. All right? And, oh, and Justin awesome. Lanasa you know, picked that up. He's bought it, and he's got Jeff Leeson's going to be living upstairs with his kiddies. And working on it and being like the administrator, and we're all going to have fun there. Great. It'll be a spot where you can come. That's, that's great. Then he's trying to talk about it. Having DMs where you pay for you can have you can come in and just pay a certain amount, and then you get food and beverage. And you can play there. There'll be like a room maybe that you can rent to stay there if you want to, to then come down and play. There'll be if you want to have a Jim Ward and Ernie Gygax. Uh, Frank Menser or somebody else run a game, then you'll pay a slightly higher price, but you'll be there, and it'll be an organized game. It's not just coming up there and say, hey, call Ernie and bring him over. But, you know, with, with planning and whatever else, an organized event can be held there. Where where I originally played with the 22 Sailors, and um, uh, as all this first level, and they went into my dungeon I, just after uh, Wonder Woman was over. We'd watch Wonder Woman and shut down the store. I had a TV in there. And then after that, because all of us like to watch Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And we're talking the original That's Linda great. Carter version, just to get oh, clear. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then after watching her boats. Dan, it sounds like have... there's a... Sounds like definitely a location that the Wandering Dams are going to have to wander to uh, in the future when we're allowed out of our houses again. That is a great point. I think that's going to be really highly in demand, and we're going to be we're going to try to get for, be first in line. <laughs> right, sounds good. Sounds yeah, I happen yeah, to sure. be involved in that, so I'll let Justin know too. That's uh, great. He's a good guy. All right, we that's we got great. we have a we have the hookup now, Dan. <laughs> And, um, that was and his, the whole point, Paul. <laughs> not only does he have this place, but he has a museum of the unusual in, in I think it's North Carolina, which is basically the same thing as uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not, with a lot of horror stuff and other already, and a tattoo shop. So this man knows business, and he's he's moving into this right now. That's great. That's fantastic. Boy, that's I think I think I think you'll have a lot of so you'll have it, a lot of uh, customers for that. Brilliant. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead, Paul. Just just to circle back though, I'm curious, um, in the in the meantime between sort of now and whenever this madness ends, is there are you doing any online gaming or is there any stuff that you're planning to do virtually? Myself, no. I when it comes to yeah. online gaming, I want to I've allowed where I have somebody at my table and they can have a, a phone or a laptop or something with a uh, with another player somewhere else, and they can talk. So they'll be both mm -hmm. at my table, but only one will be actually right. there talking to me, and they will be talking to me, not the guy on the screen. Gotcha. So you know, someone will say, "Okay, Jim, right. tell him that I want to do this. I want to do that." And then you'll say, "Okay, Frank wants to do, you know, fireball here. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, what's his initiative roll, mm -hmm. etc." So I try to keep that a, a real person involved at my table. As well, so that we can have a control, right. and I, that I can deal with maybe five people live and five online or something like that. But really? it does—you have a smaller group if you have people online. I think it just there's just too much yeah. back, back and forth discussion. I think we found that. I think we found that. The um, you know, it's funny because I, I guess I've heard Mike Morner talk about some games where your father would hide himself behind his filing cabinet so you couldn't actually see him while he ran a game. So you're kind of back at this, like you're not actually, you don't even need to visibly see one of the players, and that's perfectly fine. It, when we ran some games in the basement, which would be more of a larger group, uh, those of us that were playing were on the side where my dad's shoe repair used to be, and before that, the sand table. But the still part of that workbench existed in between, and dad and Rob, because that's when they rebooted Greyhawk. And that's when I, when I, when Rob retired Robilar and I retired Tensor, 
then I got to start with a new character, Erac, and another another wizard. And and then at some point, when I was doing a solo adventure with Erac, I was up to six level. My dad had me start on the pool level because I was two hours late for for going to bed for school, and my mom was just yelling at him and mocking and me constantly. You know, so that tells you I was a kid. I was still a kid, and. So my dad had my character, you know, die there, which was just horrible. It was crying and going to bed. And, <laughs> and he said, all your items will still be here, and they'll be here if you ever can find it again. But he said, I'm sorry, Ernie, and he took my maps, and he tore them up because your maps are down here, or I stuck them in a whatever. And he was like, oh, it was a, it was a horrible night. But then later on, I, I started with Erac's cousin, so that meant I still had access to the gold and whatever I still had stored at his room, and then I was able to work him up to about the same level with, with a couple other guys and get my shit back, most of it. <laughs> other players stole some of my other items, too. But I had a Horn of Ohala Silver, I remember, a Crystal Ball, I think, and some other things, so. <laughs> that's, that's been, that, that would make an impression, I would say. That. I would remember that for forever. <laughs> yeah. That's rough. I, the only I, love the, I, the, I love the character names. Um, we have uh, we have a, a a random question from one of our viewers that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Um, you know, I'm hearing a lot of a lot of names here with with built-in puns or or acronym names. Uh, do you have a personal favorite? Uh, a a name that uh, was used in D and D in the early days that is uh, clearly a, a a wink, or a or a pun for for the folks, for well, the players. A lot of them would be um, like Heward's mystical organ was my cousin Hugh Burdick, who built church organs and tuned and did stuff with pianos and organs since he was just a little kid. That was his, that was his whole career. Mm. That, that and somehow getting lost in Scientology. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> there, was, there was also, and, and all the tensor spells that were made for me, like the tensor's floating disc, I didn't create that spell. Okay. It was me taking someone who uh, had been killed, and I still just took all the extra bags we could, and I loaded them up with the treasure, and was dragging them along with the, me and another character or whatever else, because I wouldn't eat the copper pieces. So the idea is that we were carrying the gold on us, and then we had the lesser stuff, but we were just trying to get every little bit of everything. At all times, I have to drop the body for a while run, and then hopefully you can come back and get some treasure. Right. But the idea is that my greed. I've always, I've always been, you know, looking for that almighty experience point and, and all the better the magic items. God, I love magic items. Jim Ward too. That's, he loves his magic. That's items. great. That's great. You've, you've heard it here first. The original Tensor's floating disc was a corpse being dragged on the ground full of treasure. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> If we even had a stone statue we were taking, if somebody got turned to stone, we would still try to drape stuff on them if we had it, you know, since we already had this encumbering. <laughs> we, I, the last time I played with Paul, there was a situation yeah. with 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 petrified statues where we had a lot of trouble. That would have helped us out a lot, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. before it gets too late, I guess I, I guess I don't want to miss uh, bef right before we started here, Ernie. You were talking about uh, the other thing that's happening in Lake Geneva is oh. the Geek Nation tours, right? What oh, absolutely. The Geek Nation tour we did one last year, and it's a it's this is called the RPG, I believe, um, and it's it's by Terrace Cassidy and it's Geek Nation tours, and I put it on my my Facebook page a few times. But the, the Geek Nation Tours is something where he arranges and picks you up from the airport, uh, get, shuttles you to Lake Geneva, and you then stay overnight for and you game every day and visit places and get tours. So you're going to be at Horticultural Hall where a Gen Con started. You're going to be at, at 330 Center Street with me. Uh, doing dungeon hobby shop, dungeon or, or whatever else I pull out at the time that I feel like. Um, at the horticultural hall, we still see we generally do a, a tomb of horrors for 
one day and uh, just to try to keep in the spirit of my dad. Right. And then, as I said, we're at 123 William Street. We go out and we, we look at the TSR buildings in Sheridan Springs. My dad was born. We, you know, check, we see where the, the building downtown that's now uh, the landmark center, which was TSR after 723 William Street on Main and Broad Street. You can't get more downtown than that. A building that's been around since the 1800s. Um, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful time where not a, you, you not a spot to stay, but he throws dinner. We go out and eat one or two nights at, at local restaurants where my dad and, and all of us used to go. Um, it's, it's just immersing yourself in Lake Geneva gaming. And it's the Geek Nation Tours, and I can't say enough about it. And it's, it's not only myself. It's uh, Jim Ward is involved, Jeff Leeson. Who did the lot? Who was part of the Lost Shrine and promotion? Um, and last year, Tom Wom. I'm not sure if Tom's coming back to do this. He's a local, and I do a lot of gaming with Tom. But no matter what, it's, it's a good crew. It's still it's it's a fair amount of coin. It's like thirty six hundred bucks, and if you plus whatever your flight is. And but, but how many days is it? How many, room how, many, how, many, how many how many days does it last? Well, it's like six days, but it's like five days. Of gaming. Okay, great. It's like, you know, one, one day is just getting you here. Right. And, and setting things up and introducing everybody to each other. But yeah, even dinner time is this big table where all of you sit together and talk about gaming for the day. And all that. It's, <laughs> it's that sounds wonderful. amazing. That sounds, it's, it's, that sounds really sounds, amazing. Yeah, sounds super fun. We're, we're hoping to do this again in November. But with all, it's all, all important time whether we can get people to still throw out the coin and have the time and to be able to have the time to be able to do it after a lot of people have just had nothing but time on. Uh, but we're going to try to do it in November yeah. and we're going to do it in spring, potentially the week after Gary Con. So that Tuesday, right after Gary Con, some people that really want to double dip could fly in with the Gary Con to stay a couple of an extra night or two, and then just go right into this gaming camp, and then go home. They'll have like a two-week binge. That sounds great. And I always have at least two weeks around Gary Con. People start coming in at least a week early, and we start gaming all the time. So oh, Gary Con is wonderful. Oh, Gary Con, we can bring up Gary Con. What a shame! Shame on, shame on me. That's a fantastic time. Go so again. We're starting to fill up to miss quantities, but it's 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 just grand. It's it's like it's like the old uh, the old horticultural hall and Legion Hall gaming when we the early Gen Cons. Awesome! So that's fantastic. So yeah, I come on, and I even I even run one other thing, but it's it's real small. At the end of June, I'll hopefully we'll be able to be I'll be able to do the Ronald Donald Asia Con. What that is, it's we get together at my fiance's house, Donna Giovanni. And he tried. Robert is a fellow who tried to get into a Gary Con game with me. He's in a wheelchair. And he he can't do anything but move his head. Okay? And talk. And yet, Dungeons and Dragons has allowed him to have a life. He's 40 years old now, okay? He's never, never known, you know... <laughs> Hugging and kissing a girl, or any, you know, goddamn. So when this guy, when I couldn't let this guy come into my game, it was just too crowded. I had already eighteen people in the room was stuffed. I said, "We're going to get together and game again." Well, we've done that twice, and he's now come to Lake Geneva That's for several great. days, and other people I invite. We have about maybe up to thirteen people each day, and he's a constant. And uh, it's it's just fantastic to sit around. In the sunshine and what and just and game and then we come in and I, it's I don't know it's just another wonderful thing it's it's so limited I probably should bring it up but it's just that's what D and D brings it allows people that have issues yeah. physical mental whatever else to somehow have an escape to stimulate the brain and also to get over problems so I Dungeons and Dragons has been very good to me. And, and it started with war gaming and miniatures gaming with airfix miniatures and sand tables and it's become it's been part of my life 
as as you pointed out, I literally grabbed on on a, on a card table a Stalingrad uh, SS Panzer Division and chewed it. My dad had to make a new counter to put on the table. Okay, so I cut my teeth on gaming. That's a great story. That's a great story, and I I agree that I mean for many of us. You know, whether our challenges are small or large, like many of us have had times in our life where we, we, we needed that as an entryway to connect to other people that, you know, that wasn't, wasn't happening up until that time. So I think that we're all, we, we all agree with you that we're, we're, we're glad to have, you know, for, for many of us, this in our life. And thank you, thank you for helping to, to evolve it and develop it, Ernie. <laughs> well, it was all fun. Yeah, absolutely. That's the best kind of job to have. I worked on the uh, Monster and Treasure list as a kid in high school. I worked on the Geomorphs. I, I shipped out everybody's Empire of the Petal Thrones and, and original brown boxes. With If Rob Koontz wasn't there, it was me doing it and all this. So before I became a, a hobby shop clerk working for Terry Koontz first, and then Tom Wom, and then I ended up running the hobby shop, the mail order, Gen Con, and the Art Role Playing Game Association. At one time, I had 22 employees at TSR. I was an executive vice president in charge of consumer services and made a 22% profit margin overall on every dollar spent. That was grand. Not only was I a showcase, but we returned money to the fold. <laughs> nice. You also came up with the Game Wizards tagline, right? So, you know, back in the day, TSR, was the, you came up with the, with the Game Wizards tagline, right? Yes, because my dad... Had said that Brian was talking to him, and they thought the the uh, lizard man was just too war game. Mm -hmm. So they needed, and I said, well, and now mm -hmm. in those days there was a toy company called Cody, and they had a cricket. So I said, Cody has a cricket. I said, we are playing a fantasy game, which we are the game wizards. And then, so my dad said, stand the clock. So put your feet on my desk. Here's a here's a glass of Carvassier, and here's a cigar. <laughs> now you've just done an executive kind of thing. Welcome to the club. And I got to, <laughs> I got to bask in some glory. I got minimum wage for two hours sitting drinking and smoking. <laughs> 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 we can all wish we'll all wish for that <laughs> I know but still you know in those days there wasn't nobody was making good money yet you know Tim Cass was the first hired employee to collect money but then after that my dad was getting some when my dad was doing this we were on food stamps in those days food stamps meant paying in what you could afford to get more dollars in food Great. Yep. Understood. A, Understood. Yeah. yeah. There, was, there was a lot of it was it was hard to get going to the grocery store or whatever else and having people look down their nose at you like oh look at this they're getting free stuff you know. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Later on, a lot of those same people suddenly were kissing you know my dad's feet whatever else he was a board a board member at the local <laughs> bank and had three when we had over. Over 300 employees at TSR. Suddenly, it was a um, oh, you've changed so much. It's like a W.C. Fields film where the wife is always nagging at him and yelling. Yeah. At him. You, you love that rotten guy, and at the end, when he becomes rich, he's such a changed man. Oh, I love him so much. You know, and he's doing the same stuff. He's now just wearing better clothes. <laughs> I, th I think you can tell the real quality of a person if if they if their treatment of of of, of somebody changes based on their place in life, right? You could that's, yeah. that's a real that's a real solid tell, and and I guess I guess your family has gotten to gotten to experience that real real distinctly. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, Paul. So I so I I, I want to well, talk with Ernie for like hour like all day long, but we should pro we should probably hold to our yeah. normal show yeah, schedule, man, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, do, absolutely. We're gonna have to wrap it up here. Uh, <laughs> if yeah, you want to stay good. on, so thanks stay everyone on. for joining us. All right. Yeah. And um, and and uh, I hope we can right. have you back sometime, Ernie. You think that you think right. that could happen in the future when you have another project or something? Sure. Cool. Absolutely. Cool.
Awesome. So yeah, uh, we'll just tell our okay. viewers here, uh, remember that uh, you can uh, like and follow and subscribe to us on YouTube and Twitter and Twitch and Facebook. And uh, we're by the handle Wandering DMs on all those sites. If I could put in one more likewise, thing. Likewise, you can listen. My, yeah. my go ahead. Yeah, go for it, Danny. It's public for everybody. And there's tons and tons and tons of photo albums of old TSR gaming and even current gaming and things going on, as well as my personal life with my pets and my girl and whatever. But there's a lot of good reference material for anybody who's interested in the, the, the history of Dungeons and Dragons in particular, and then all sorts of other gaming in general. I agree. I follow Ernie's page myself, great. and it's really great. great. You should you should watch that. <laughs> yeah, so you should go, uh, yeah, definitely uh, advise our listeners and viewers to go uh, Go check it Ernest out. Look Gary up uh, Ernie Gygax on uh, Facebook, and apparently you'll find quite a lot. Yep, Ernest Gary Gygax. Uh, you you can also catch you can also catch our show uh, in audio only podcast format if you want. Uh, that's available on our website at wanderingdms.com, uh, as well as various podcast carriers such as iTunes and Spotify and Google Podcast. Uh, if you are listening to this show on one of those carriers, please take a moment to rate and review us. We really appreciate it. And i got to give a thanks to our patrons who support our show. Um, if you'd like to join them, please do visit patreon.com slash wanderingdms where you can support this show and other shows that we do. Enormous thanks to Ernie today. Thank you so much for coming on. And we yeah. hope that you will look, our, our viewers and listeners will look for uh, the Memorial Tomb Project and uh, the Lost City of Gaxmore. That's at Troll Lord Games. Uh, I'll point out that, you know, you do have um, uh, stretch goals that you have reached, that there's fifth edition conversions and a whole bunch of other editions for your Memorial Tomb Project. Look for Ernie Gygax on Facebook, really easy to find there. And also look for the upcoming Geek Nation tours, all kinds of exciting stuff in the Lake Geneva area. So thank you to Ernie. We hope they'll have, have you on again. Remember that we are live every uh, Sunday with the talk show here, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So we hope that you'll join us again next week for another thought-provoking discussion. All right. Thank you. We'll see you then. Bye.